Hello, my name is Sebastian Munz. I'm a postdoc in the working group Cropping Systems and Modeling at the University of Hohenheim in Germany. And I'm glad that today I can give you a talk about intercropping for climate resilience. This talk is uh, related to the EU project Remix, in which we um, are working on the simulation of the effect of climate change and climate reliability scenarios on species mixture performance and resilience. Then by simulation we want to explore the potential for adapting species mixtures and make them more resilient to climate change. Um, this work is done together with colleagues from France, from CIRAT and from INRAE. First of all, I will give you a short background about the predicted climate change and its impact on crop growth. So the global CO2 concentration is expected to increase to 420 to 940 ppm by the year 2100. This large range depends on the results of different representative concentration pathways. In general, the higher CO2 concentration will stimulate photosynthesis and also reduce water stress uh, by reduced transpiration. The climate simulation models, they are driven, among other factors, by CO2 equivalence. This does not only include the CO2 concentration, but also the concentration of methane and nitrous oxides. So here at the bottom in this graph, you can see the CO2 equivalence um, between the year 2000 and 2100. And here you have this different representative concentration pathways that they depend on how in the future um, we continue to emit those um, warming potential gases. So based on this predicted increase in CO2 equivalence, in Europe the temperature is expected to increase and this increase is between 1 and 5 degrees in 2081 to 2100. Um, depending also on the representative concentration pathway. Um, a higher temperature above the optimum can induce heat stress. A higher temperature will also accelerate phenology and can also lead to water stress. Uh, here in this figure, you can see the daily maximum temperature in 2055 um, compared to a baseline scenario, which was from 1980 to 2010. What I want to show you here is, we have here two of these concentration pathways, 4.5 and 8.5, and here we have the output from different climate simulation models. So you can see that in general the, the trend among Europe is similar, however we can see here also large uh, differences in the absolute changes predicted. The predicted rainfall shows a distinct trend across Europe. In North and Central Europe, there's an increase predicted between 1 and 12%. In the South of Europe, there's a predicted decrease between 7 and 26%. And in general, there's a predicted higher frequency of drought events, which can, of course, uh, induce water stress to the crops, also during different phenological stages. Here again, uh, a graph for these different climate simulation models for two concentration pathways. And here you can also see again, the trend is more or less similar for the different simulation models. However, the absolute values differ between the simulation models. So there is an uncertainty involved already in this different predicted climate change. So the main question is, if, can intercropping increase resilience under climate change? In general, a climate change will require an adaptation of current cropping systems to make them more resilient. I would define it as resilience as a higher yield stability under variable and adverse weather conditions. If we look at the literature, we can see, for example, that intercropping showed a higher yield stability across different climatic zones which can somehow indicate that there's a higher resilience under variable climate conditions. But in general, the advantage of intercropping is that we have multiple crops per area, which can reduce the risk in case of crop failure of one crop. In this case, there is the possibility of compensation growth of the crop that is less affected under these stressful conditions. In general, this compensation growth um, also depends strongly on species complementarity 
That means, um, for example, differences in the use of nitrogen sources, like an N-fixing species and a non-fixing species, or also differences in rooting pattern, which then also allow like a better exploration of the soil to extract water. There are of course many different intercropping systems, species, temporal and spatial arrangements, but here as a start on this topic, um, we decided to focus on cereal legume intercropping. Um, this is an important and comparably well-studied system in Europe already. Um, in this system, especially the complementary nitrogen use is giving a high productivity and also a high quality of the cereal. That means a higher protein concentration in the grain of the cereal compared to the sole crop. And this results you see particularly under low nitrogen conditions. There are also other studies and meta-analysis that showed with agronomic management, for example, the sowing date, sowing density, or nitrogen fertilization, we can affect the yield share of cereals and legumes, meaning that we can also agronomically influence the interaction between these crops. But it has to be stated that there are no specific experiments on intercrops in general under climate change conditions. So the question is, um, which management options um, can be used to make species mixtures more resilient under climate change. To deal with the high complexity, for example related to interspecific interactions and also the high uncertainty related to the difference in the predicted climate change, uh, modeling is essential. Until now there is no modeling study involving species mixtures under climate change. But there are several crop growth models available to simulate intercrops. And they differ in their complexity, for example, if they include soil, plant and atmosphere, or only parts of this. And they also differ in the types of intercrops that can be simulated. For example, some models are dedicated to strip intercrops, and others can only simulate mixed crops or row intercrops. Uh, for our simulation, uh, we need a crop growth model that does simulate processes between soil, plant and atmosphere. Also a model that's able to simulate cereal legume intercrops and also allow us to simulate management intervention. That means to simulate the impact of, for example, different sowing dates or sowing ratios of the intercrops. So for our study, we decided to use the STIX crop model. Uh, STIX is a daily time step crop model which incorporates input variables related to climate, soil, and also cropping system. So we can simulate single crops, intercropping, and also successive crops. And we can simulate the effect of different management options. Um, the model was already used for climate change simulations within model in the comparison studies, and recently also on spring and winter legumes. So it provides a good basis um, for our study that the model was already tested in these situations. Um, the main simulated processes are crop growth, which is radiation driven by the radiation use efficiency, and it simulates development of the crops, which is mainly temperature driven, and it simulates the water and nitrogen balances. Um, water and nitrogen stress are also taken into account. There are stress indices that can then reduce the potential crop growth. STIX, there's also an intercrop version, which can already simulate these specific mixtures, so mixtures of two crop species, which are completely mixed, or which are in a spatial row configuration. So we have one row of one species, and then alternate it with a row of another species. And it was already used to simulate cereal legume intercrops, and showed there the good potential to simulate these systems. As Dix is originally a sow crop model, there we needed some new modules to connect the two sow crop models that are simulated to allow a simulation of intercropping. So there's one module that simulates the above ground competition for light between the crops, and there are two different approaches. One is the so called hedge row approach, this is for row intercrops. So this is a 2D spatial model where you take into account the row distance between the intercrops the individual height and width, and you can also use a different canopy shape, like a rectangle or a triangle. And then it simulates how much light is available for each crop. And then there's the normal Beer-Lambert law approach used, which um, calculates an 
exponential extinction of light depending on the leaf area index and the extinction coefficient. The extinction coefficient, um, simply said, describes the, the leaf angle of the species. So you would have a lower value for a plant with more erect leaves, like a cereal, or you would have a higher value for a plant with more planophyll leaves, like a pea, for example. And there's another approach. When we have mixed crops, we can also just use this Beer-Lambert law, and then it only depends on leaf area index and the extinction coefficient. Then there's another module for the below ground competition for water and nitrogen. So here we have like the crop species, they are calibrated for sow crops. And so they have a different resource use, these species, also different rooting pattern, and also different sensitivity to stresses. For example, if there's water stress or nitrogen stress. And then this interaction between the crops, it's simulated via their influence on the soil status. So like one crop is taking up water and nitrogen from a specific soil layer. So it changes the conditions of availability of these resources in this layer. And this is then influencing the root system of the other crop. Like if we are only simulating here mixed crops or row intercrops, so they're very close together. So it has shown that it works well if we just have a one dimensional soil model this means we only have a, a vertical differentiation in the soil profile. Here you see examples um, from a simulation of a pea barley intercrop. So here we had um, two years of experiments and simulation. Um, we had here two years without nitrogen and we had here in 2003 another treatment where a high rate of nitrogen was applied. Like the black dots are the pea intercrop and the white ones is for barley. So we can see when we have a low nitrogen level, like in those two treatments, that the pea is much more competitive, given its ability to fix nitrogen and giving the high uh, stress response of cereals to nitrogen limitations. But here, if we, like in this treatment, increase the end fertilization, we see that the barley becomes much more competitive than the pea. And this is also shown here, like for example, how nitrogen fertilization can change like the competition between these crops. To make this able that the model reacts like this, um, there are two parts are uh, important considering this N complementary use or also competition between the crops. Like first, uh, mineral nitrogen has an effect on the radiation use efficiency and also leaf growth and senescence. This means in the sense of if there's not enough mineral nitrogen available um, compared to the crop demand, then there's nitrogen stress simulated and this will then reduce the radiation use efficiency, for example, like here for this black line. So a lower value of the stress index will just reduce um, the radiation use efficiency. On the other hand, we have here a calculation that when we have very high mineral nitrogen contents in the rooting zone, then the legume will reduce its nitrogen fixation. So when these two crops come together, like the cereal will take up a lot of nitrogen, reducing the mineral nitrogen in the soil, this will then stimulate the N2 fixation by the legume crop. So now you have the background about the projected climate change impacts and also about how the sticks crop model works. So now we'll shortly show you the workflow we had to achieve our aim to model cereal legume intercropping under climate change. So first we collected a good data set which included four years of experimental data for two locations in France. There we had data on the soil and the intercrops. There were two distinct systems. We had on one hand a spring pea spring barley system and on the other hand, a winter pea, winter wheat system. There were also included different end fertilizer levels and also plant densities. The second step was that the new Stix intercrop version was developed. Um, there was a substantial revision and also improvement of the model code. 
Um, we saw that when we simulate in a wider range based on our data set, there are some problems in the simulations. So we made a substantial revision. And one aspect that helped a lot was that we were simulating a self-intercrop. This means um, we simulate intercrops, but we take two times the same crop. And finally, if the model works well, it should simulate the same for both of these intercrops. And there we already found a lot of problems in the simulation, which were then fixed. And there's now a manuscript in preparation by Remy Vesey. And then the third step was we calibrated the new Stix intercrop version for the sole crops. So for the spring system and the winter system, and then we evaluated the simulation for the intercrops. Um, we saw that the simulations improved very well and we had a good performance, both for the winter and the spring intercrops. And this was all based on the sole crop parameterization. So there was no additional parameterization for the intercrops. This manuscript is now also in preparation. So the fourth step is, which I will present to you today, is a sensitivity analysis where we made fixed changes in temperature, rainfall, and CO2 concentration, and evaluated especially the interactions between the intercrops. And then the last final step is that we will conduct simulations with real climate change scenarios, where we have changes in temperature, rainfall, and CO2. So, but now finally, let's come to the simulations. Um, here I will show you simulations for spring pea, spring barley intercrop system. Um, it was planted in an alternate row design with a row distance of 17.5 centimeters. And in intercrops we had the half density of the respective sole crops. The fertilization is moderate with 70 kg nitrogen per hectare and it's rain fat, so no additional irrigation. For the so-called here baseline scenario, which is the basis then to compare to the sensitivity analysis for different temperatures, rainfall, and CO2 concentrations. I took here 20 years of weather data. You see the two respective periods. During these periods, I had all weather inputs that I need for the simulations. Below here on the left side, you see the mean across the 20 years for maximum temperature in red and minimum temperature in blue. And on the right side, you see the cumulative rainfall during these respective years where you can see that there was a considerable variation of rainfall. So here you see simulations for the leaf area index and the light interception. This is like the average simulation during the season over the 20 years. This is for the intercrops. You can see here in green the intercrop P and blue the intercrop barley. What we can see here is in the system that initially barley has a stronger growth. So here it has a higher LAI than the P, which also leads to a higher fraction of light absorption. And then later during the season, like there's the N limitation, which limits the growth of the barley. And then the P, being a nitrogen fixing species, becomes more competitive, having a higher leaf area index than the barley, and then also a higher light interception. Here are simulations um, for the sole crops and the intercrops. And here you can see uh, in blue, it's the nitrogen uptake of barley over the, during the season. In green, you see nitrogen uptake of the pea. And the red is the nitrogen fixation of the pea, being a part of this total nitrogen uptake. Yeah. Here for the sole crops, we can see that 65% of this uptake of pea was um, derived by N2 fixation. If we look here on the right side, um, for the intercrops, we can see for the intercrop P that 84% of the nitrogen uptake was derived by N2 fixation. So here you can see that the intercrop barley takes up more nitrogen, so it reduces the mineral nitrogen in the soil, so N2 fixation of the P is stimulated. So now here you can see the average grain yield simulated over the 20 years. Um, here you can see the yield from the intercrop barley and the intercrop pea. And here's the total yield of this intercropping system. The error bar is the standard deviation. So first of all, we can see that the intercropping system had a higher yield. If we look at stability, here defined by the standard deviation, the stability is quite comparable 
to both Sotrop Bali and Sotrop P. So for more direct comparison of the yields in intercrops and sow crops, I calculated here the land equivalent ratio and also the partial land equivalent ratio. The partial land equivalent ratio, for example, for P, is calculated by the yield in the intercrop P divided by the yield in the sow crop P. And likewise for barley. And the land equivalent ratio then is the sum of both. Here on the left side in this graph, you can see first the LER, which we can see is between 1.2 and 1.4 in 50% of the cases. This means that you would need in the sole crop 20 to 40% more land to produce the same yields as in the intercrop. When we look at the partial LER, um, in the intercrop we occupied half the land with one crop compared to the sole crop. This means if the partial LER is above 0 0.5, the crop had a better performance in the intercrop compared to the sole crop. And we can see here that for both P and also barley, it's above 1.5, and P shows a bit better performance here in the intercrop compared to the barley. On the right side, you see the simulations for the grain nitrogen concentration. Here first for the sole crop P and the intercrop P, here we can see there's no large difference, as the P does not rely so much on mineral soil nitrogen, as it can fix also atmospheric nitrogen. If we look for the sole crop barley here, the intercrop barley, here we can see that the intercrop barley has a higher grain nitrogen concentration as it is relieved from the strong nitrogen competition as when it is intercropped with the pea instead of with another barley crop. So now the question is, how would this performance of the intercropping system change under climate change? And here first I show you simulations about fixed changes in CO2 rainfall and temperature. Um, you saw now simulations for the baseline scenario with this temperature and rainfall input. And now I made fixed changes in CO2, temperature and rainfall uh, to the daily values in this baseline scenario. I made temperature increase by 2, 4, 6 and 8 degrees. And then rainfall was reduced by 20, 40, 60 and 80 percent. And the CO2 concentration was increased to 450, 540, 630, and 720. So here you can see the results for the simulation for this increase in temperature. So here for this zero, that's always the baseline scenario, and then the other scenarios with an increase in temperature. First on the left side is the LER. Here we can see that at an increase of two degrees, there's not much change, but then we had a trend that is decreasing towards 8 degrees. If we look at the partial LER of P, we can see here all this tendency that we see for the LER. And for the PLER barley, we see it's quite stable across the different temperature increases. But to explain this simulated uh, response for an increase in temperature, then I look into the dynamics. This means like the simulations during the season were averaged um, per day across the 20 years of simulation. And there, first of all, we can see that the growing period was shortened with an increase in temperature. Like at the baseline scenario, the harvest was around day 190. With an increase of temperature of 4 degrees, it was around 175. And with an increase in temperature of 8 degrees, the harvest date was on day 160. It did not result in a difference between the intercrops, um, but we could see that especially this period where the P has a higher LEI than the barley was shortened with a higher temperature. So here you can see that this part here became much shorter. This is why barley became more competitive for light interception, and this explained the best in the simulations that the partial LER of P decreased with the increase in temperature. Now we come to the simulations for the decrease in rainfall. Here again, the LER and the partial LER. Uh, we can see that here we have a different trend simulated. Um, the LER is steadily increasing, at least up to 40% of rainfall. And this was especially because the partial LER of barley showed a steady increase with a decrease in rainfall. But at the same time, we can see 
that as well there was a tendency for the partial area of P with an increase to about 60% of rainfall, but then we can see a decrease. For explaining the simulated results, it was helpful to look again at the leaf area index of the intercrops during the season, and this time in relation to the simulated water stress. So we can see here, for example, for the scenario with 100% rainfall, we see here the leaf area index of both crops, and below we see the simulated water stress. We can see that it's not very high, the simulated water stress, and it's more during the end of the season. With a decrease in rainfall, here in the center we see the 60% treatment, and here with 20% of rainfall, we can see here that the water stress increases, of course, because we have a reduced rainfall, and particularly it increases for the intercrop P. As barley has a faster, deeper root growth, it can also obtain more water from the soil. But here it's not very much affecting still the leaf area index, but if we look at the scenario with 20% rainfall, we see a very strong water stress simulated for the P, which has an onset very early in the season. And this decreases the leaf area index of P very much and decreasing therefore the competitiveness for light uh, against barley. So finally, we look on the results for the simulations for an increase in CO2 concentration. Here we can see, first of all, with the LAR, that it's more or less stable across the different concentrations with a slightly decreasing trend. Um, this trend was mostly due to a decreasing trend for the partial LER of P, and barley was quite stable until 540 ppm and then showed an increasing trend. Again, this could be well related um, to the leaf area index and light interception, as in the examples before, because the barley has a faster initial growth, then it's stimulated by higher CO2 concentration, which gives it also later an advantage um, for light interception. So in summary, the sensitivity analysis indicated that especially the temporal dynamics and leaf area index, which determine to a large degree the light interception, given the similar height in this intercropping system, that this was a good determinant integrating the impact of different climatic conditions. So we saw increase in temperature led to a shorter growing period, especially shortening this period where the LEI of P was higher than the LEI of barley. The simulations with a decrease in rainfall showed that especially water stress of P increases and this also reduces the leaf area index. In general, it also showed that the intercrop barley becomes more competitive given its faster initial growth. So it means it also penetrates faster into the soil and can extract more water. So now the next steps are a sensitivity analysis for winter pea and winter wheat. And then finally to conduct simulations with real climate change scenarios and also different agronomic management options. For example, changing the sowing ratio of the intercrops or the sowing date or the nitrogen fertilization. But in general, we have to be sure that there's a lot of uncertainty involved here, not only from the climate change simulations, but also that there's a lack of experiments on this interspecific interactions under climate change scenarios. So I see the main purpose of this simulations that the modeling can help to test hypotheses and therefore guide research. So thank you very much for your attention.